Port of the Gun, the bike, and today we are on a sweltering afternoon. On the Upper East Side, we're gonna run in here to Skarstedt. And we're gonna try to get some pictures of an exhibition. Steve Perino, Paintings and Drawings, 1986 to 2003. The old Wildenstein galleries. see the show it's sweltering outside it's probably in the mid 90s and uh, I was a long bike ride in from Brooklyn this piece is titled untitled 1992 enamel on canvas 96 and a half by 36 inches well uh, I've been a fan of Stephen Perino's work for probably at least uh, 15 years, and uh, well, I'd seen it around a few times before his uh, untimely passing, I guess it was in 2005, and uh, well, there's a lot of backstory, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through and look at some of the work. So this is actually a selection of paintings and drawings from 1985 to 2004, something like that. This is titled Untitled 1989 Enamel and Lacquer on Tracing Paper, 18 by 23. Uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of people that are looking at Steve now and sort of realizing that he was a very influential and important painter. And uh, in certain ways, he came of age along with a group called the Pictures Generation. But I think Steve was always a more of a uh, formalist and also was very uh, committed to the idea of painting. This is titled Bentoff Kelter's Lime, 1995. And uh, I think I may have uh, seen this piece at a show at the Journal Gallery out in Williamsburg, uh, maybe a couple of years ago. Well, Stephen Perino was kind of a interesting character. Uh, a lot of people see his a relationship between his work and people like Piero Manzoni and uh, maybe even the Support Surface group, the French group of painters that came of age in the late 60s that were dealing with the idea of what is a painting, what is the surface, what are the structures that you use to support a painting. This piece is also enamel and silicone on honeycomb aluminum. And, uh, well, I think Steve is even related to people like uh, maybe Sam Gilliam, who was uh, dealing with fabric and the presentation of paintings. Also, I was going to say that uh, from what I know of Stephen Perino, he was kind of a badass rock and roll, uh, even sort of like a situationist person. And uh, so it's kind of uh, ironic that his work would be shown in such a extremely elegant uh, background. And it does kind of put the work into a different context. This is untitled 1991, enamel on canvas, 72 by 48 inches. 
Well, one of the things that uh, I'm surprised with is uh, some of Steve's coloristically uh, punchy uh, paintings. A lot of the stuff that I'd seen previously was mostly black or some monochrome dark maroon or something. And, uh, well, something like this is very almost decorative. Oh, I like this piece. This is titled Spin Out Vortex Black Hole 2000 Lacquer on Canvas. Well, as I said, I, I never met Steve, but uh, I have met and talked to some people that were involved with him, played in rock and roll bands with him. One of the guys is Mark Dagley. Uh, I think you could probably go back in the files a couple of years and check out a show that we covered of his. Uh, I mean, there were stories at this point, I guess they're myths about how uh, Steve would work on a series of paintings and he would exhibit them and then he would take them back. A lot of them didn't sell at the time and uh, he would cut them apart, sew them back together again, restretch them, do other things with them. And uh, so I was always kind of fascinated with how much uh, extra canvas he would leave on the edges because he intentionally was uh, going to be coming back and uh, using that extra fabric as a uh, area within which to play his other games. I also like the way that uh, yeah, his twisting gives you a nice uh, kind of central movement or a casting out from the center and uh, a lot of people talk about formalism and people ask me what does formalism actually mean and uh, I think in Steve's case it's not so much uh, graphic formalism as it is the idea of uh, what the form of a painting is. What is a stretched canvas? What do you stretch a canvas on? How much of the canvas is actually considered within the aesthetic perspectives of painting? This is titled Death in America Number Three. Acrylic on canvas and gesso. This is 1,000, uh, 107 by 72. Well, I was also looking at this and sort of getting an echo of uh, Rauschenberg's bed painting from the, the early 50s. And uh, while well, I was mentioning Piero Manzoni and some of his uh, rippled canvases, and I think that uh, Steve really does take the idea of the, uh, the rippled and the restretched canvases to a whole new level. And uh, even if these weren't painted, there would be a lot of great uh, compositional effects just from the, the flow of the folds. And of course, this all kind of relates to uh, Baroque drapery. This is untitled 1991, enamel on canvas, 60 by 60.
This is untitled. 1989, enamel and lacquer on tracing paper. Well, they were saying that this is one of the first times there's been a major um, collection of his works on paper that has been displayed. And uh, I think he's got maybe a couple of bodies of work. One of them are the collages. And then I think that there are other pieces that are more like studies for the paintings. Okay, let's go upstairs. This is titled Stockade. Existential trip for speed freaks. 1988 to 91. Kind of a uh, poignant and uh, ironic title. I guess that uh, Steve actually died in a motorcycle accident coming home from a uh, New Year's Eve celebration in 2004-2005. And I think I've seen this painting at uh, Gagosian, if I'm not mistaken. This is titled Death in America, number six. And uh, while well, they're presenting this almost as an installation piece, okay, I'm thinking of a, an Oscar Murillo piece that I saw at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in there painting of the Forever Now show that had uh, unstretched painted canvases laying on the floor in front of stretched canvases, acrylic on canvas and gesso with two paintings painted and wrinkled placed on the ground, 71 by 71. Okay, so, uh, well, this gets to the point that I was talking about that Steve in a certain way is more of a uh, conceptual formalist. And uh, as I was saying, that he was a contemporary of the pictures generation people like Cindy Sherman, Robert Longo, Jack Goldstein. But I think because he was always more involved in painting and the, the pictures generation were more anti-painting, that he was kind of a an outsider to that little group, but I think this is a great, uh, great little conceptual piece. It's a work on paper. We're gonna uh, visit a whole little gallery of just his collages downstairs. I think this is a uh, great installation of his more large-scale works. This is titled China Desade, 1987. Acrylic on canvas, 70 by 55. Well, like I said, I'm very interested in seeing this group of work. 
and I saw a pretty good selection of paintings and some of his collage work at Freeze in the spring, but um, it's not the same thing when you're standing in the middle of a busy art fair with thousands of gawkers streaming by. Uh, okay, there's some interesting things about this painting. One of them is that uh, a lot of his painting is done with enamels and this is uh, acrylic so you get a much flatter surface on there. And uh, well that just reads reads differently in the whole uh, way that the uh, unprimed canvas reads on that is different as well. I was very impressed with this piece. This is large. This is titled For Pierre Hubert, 1990. Well, that's interesting. Pierre Aubert was a, is a uh, pretty interesting and active art dealer, art collector. I sold a major painting to him back early in my career, and uh, he was one of the big movers and shakers, and I think he even organized or was part of organizing some art fairs in Asia at some point. This is 96 by 84. Uh, getting back to Steve, so he was, uh, I think he died at the age of about 45, something like that, 47. And uh, they were talking to, I believe his name is Jose Ferrar, who runs Team Gallery. And uh, he was representing Steve at the time of his death, and he was interviewed in they asked him about Steve's market. He said, I had five shows of his work in the eight years that I worked with him, and out of that we sold two paintings. I think they were nine and ten thousand dollars a piece. And, uh, well, the last thing I heard was some of these pieces are going for north of a million dollars now. Uh, one of the great things about the, uh, these rumpled paintings is the way that it makes you think about uh, the color, the painted surface, how the color changes as it uh, folds over. This is titled Death in America Number 2, Acrylic on Canvas 2003. I also think that uh, the fact that these were primed and stretched and painted and then taken off and restretched, and you get a chance to see uh, the staple dents and things like that in the canvas, that's all interesting. Also, I would love to know what's uh, going on in the back of these now, how much extra canvas is left over. Oh, that's cool. This is titled Screwball. 1988 acrylic on canvas, 72 by 72. Well, as I said, you know, Steve was maybe a much more uh, sensual colorist than I originally thought. And, uh, well, between the pink piece that we saw downstairs and this one, 
you can see that he's almost <laughs> almost getting into the uh, the range of the happy kitchen colors. At least that's what my old art instructor always talked about, the happy yellows and pinks and light blues. And it does make you think a little bit differently about the yellow when you see the uh, gradations due to the uh, angle of the ripples. This is an interesting piece. Silver Surfer. Okay, I was never Never a fan of that Marvel character, but uh, at least it turned into a nice painting. Uh, yeah, so Steve has done other paintings where he's used the curves or he's got circles cut out of the middle. I like this curved edge. And also the way that uh, the left half is unaffected by the wrinkling and then it's almost like it's a diptych. You have the, the right half where all the rumpling and puckering happens. Okay, this is the last gallery of paintings. This is titled Bite. Nineteen eighty six. Enamel on canvas, seventy two by forty eight. Well, I was looking at this and uh, I was just enjoying the kind of the sensual monochrome painting and also noticing that there was no rumpling, but there was this uh, bite taken out. And, well, I'm thinking that Steve might have also been looking at people like Ellsworth Kelly. This is Death in America, number five, acrylic on canvas and gesso, 106 by 71 inches. And it says it's stamped with Steve Perino. Okay, the, uh, the effect of the Silver and white stripes is very interesting, and uh, God, he could have built an entire career out of just doing striped, rumpled pieces. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, oh, it looks like a number 12 cotton duck. That's kind of an interesting uh, surface texture.
This is titled Crowbar, 1987, canvas frame, Crowbar. And, uh, yeah, he's using some kind of dark gray fabric. Maybe that's dark gray canvas. And, yeah, if he uh, made the stretcher bars, he's a pretty... Uh, Pretty competent woodworker. Got some nice joints there. Yeah, I actually like the uh, the implication of the ripped out rectangle. Fold it over. Okay, that makes me think a little bit of Robert Morris's felt pieces where he would uh, hang thick straps of felt on the wall and sort of let them fall down. In a, I'm calling that process art. you guess the name of this one? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, Blue Idiot. I mean, this would be a real, uh, real prime piece. This is 1986. And again, we've got uh, the right-hand side that is kind of normally stretched with looks like hand-painted text. And then the, uh, the left side is unstretched and rumpled. And yeah, Steve was a motorcycle guy, so he probably liked uh, hot rods and things like that too. And uh, yeah, this kind of enamel surface almost looks like uh, automotive paint. This is titled Two Slots. 1987 enamel on canvas, 72 by 48. It's 1987, and, uh, well, I can't help but uh, get a little echo of Don Judd and some of his early pieces, especially the, uh, the monochrome red slot pieces that he was making in 64, 65, 66. Steve was a uh, wonderful monochrome painter. Okay. Now we'll go down and look at the collages. I'm not going to give you the titles of all of these, but uh, I'll just say that uh, most of them are black and white photography, photo collages. And, uh, okay, 
looks like he might have some tape in there, maybe not. Well, I think these are much more easily associated with the pictures generation. People like Barbara Kruger or Jack Goldstein. I think most of these are probably uh, 18 by 16, something within that category. Long Island Molita. I think also these kind of display Steve's punk rock aesthetic. And they were saying that uh, although he's been getting a lot of exposure with his paintings lately, that the, uh, the drawings haven't really been seen that much and that this is maybe the first time that they've exhibited a large selection of the work. Okay, so I, I think that's Andy Warhol's torso. Some of these are based on B-grade 1950s cinema and, uh, and that could be the Black Dahlia murder photographs. Gosh. Okay. Ew. So I'm seeing a theme here. The duct tape is a very appropriate material. It's that uh, some kind of synthetic metallic look of a lot of the paintings. Yeah, I'm looking at a lot of this now and thinking, okay, I see this on the internet all the time, but maybe in the late 80s, early 90s, this stuff was still pretty transgressive. images on our Facebook page. Okay, is that Lou Reed? I think uh, Steve was a bass player if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. Okay, so we got some S and M. James Com reporting on Steve Perino, paintings and drawings, at Skarstedt on East 64th Street on the Upper East Side. You can like this, share, recommend it to your friends, and you can subscribe. And you can leave your thoughts, ideas, comments, criticisms, and reviews below. All we ask is that you please say, Thank you, Kate. Oh, thank you, thank you. That was beautiful, beautiful.